In today's readings, two great truths from the Creed are placed before our eyes. Those two truths are resurrection and judgment. Resurrection, we, of course, hear our Lord in the gospel say, I say to the young man, arise. St. Paul speaks the judgment when he says, God is not mocked. What things a man shall sow, that also shall he reap. For he that soweth in the flesh of the flesh, he shall also reap. And he that soweth in the spirit of the spirit, he shall reap life everlasting. So those two truths, resurrection and judgment. It's important to realize when we're speaking of judgment that each man undergoes two judgments. Each one of us here will undergo two judgments. The first judgment will happen at the moment of death. Death, of course, is when the soul leaves the body. And at the moment of death, we appear instantly at that moment before the judgment seat of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I will read you from a theological manual, a teaching of the church. Immediately after death, the particular judgment takes place, in which by divine sentence of judgment, the eternal fate of the deceased person is decided. The consuls of Lyon and Florence declared that the souls of the just, free from all sin and punishment, are immediately assumed into heaven. That's right after their judgment. And the souls of those who die in mortal sin or merely in venial sin, die in mortal sin, descend into hell. The principle, of course, of judgment, we spoke about that before, but it's important to keep before our mind's eye, is the principle of judgment is related to the state of our soul at death. Are we in the state of grace? In other words, are we supernaturally alive? To say that we're in the state of grace is the same as saying we're supernaturally alive. If we die with sanctifying grace in our souls, we will be saved. We might have to go to purgatory and be purified, as St. Paul writes about as being saved as through fire, but we'll be saved because we've died supernaturally alive. If we die without sanctifying grace, that is to say, not in the state of grace, we can't go to heaven, and we couldn't live there if we got there. To live, to get to heaven and to live in heaven require powers that are completely beyond our natural ability. That's what sanctifying grace gives us, is that power. If we die without it, we haven't got those powers, which means that we'll have to go to hell. Sanctifying grace, the state of grace, of course, is present in our body from the moment of our baptism till our death, unless we so foolishly should do something like commit a mortal sin. Because that's what a mortal sin does, is it drives sanctifying grace out of the soul. We've turned to God, we've looked him in the eye, in effect, and said, get out of my life, and turned completely away from him. That's what even one mortal sin does. And because we don't have sanctifying grace, we can't be saved. It's important to keep that in mind. Sometimes there's these fantastical theories running around from some people that, uh, I, you know, the only thing missing is the tail and the horns when they say it. When they, well, it doesn't really, you know, nobody's going to get down for really one mortal sin. Well, of course they are. If you have even one mortal sin, you're not alive anymore. And if you appear, one unconfessed mortal sin, you appear before the judgment seat, you cannot go to heaven. You don't have the principle of life to live in heaven. So that's the particular judgment, okay? We've talked about that before, the moment of death. The second judgment happens after the resurrection of the dead, at the end of the world. We talk about that in the creed. Every time we say the creed, he'll come to judge the living and the dead. We come again in glory to judge the living and dead. We'll return to this point. So the two judgments are particular judgment and general judgment. Particular is the moment of death. The general judgment it's at the end of the world after the resurrection of the dead. So let's turn to the resurrection of the dead. I'll read to you, teaching the church, from this manual. All the dead will rise again on the last day with their bodies. It says this is day fide. That means it's of the faith. In other words, when something's day fide, defined by the church or of the faith, a person denies that's a heretic, which if they deliberately denied that, it's a very serious mortal sin. The Apostles' Creed, we profess that we believe in the resurrection of the body. 
the Athanasian Creed, another one of the great creeds of the church, says, on his coming, all men with their bodies must arise. And just in a few minutes, uh, you'll be singing in the, in the creed, you'll be singing, et expecto, resurrectione mortuorum. And I look for the resurrection of the dead. It takes place in the twinkling of an eye, as St. Paul assures us. Now, what about at the resurrection of the dead? I'll continue. The dead will rise again with the same bodies as they had on earth. Again, this is de fide. It's of the faith. I will read you from the teaching of Fourth Lateran Council. The Fourth Lateran Council in 1215. Quote, He, that is to say Christ, He will come at the end of the world to judge the living and the dead and to render to all according to their works, whether to the reprobate or to the elect, who will all arise with their own bodies that they have in this life to be rewarded according to their works, whether good or evil, the wicked to go into eternal punishment with the devil, the good to receive everlasting glory with Christ. Close quote, ladder and four. In other words, all men, all men will rise again on the last day. And they will have the same bodies they had in this life. Why? Because the same body which shared in the deeds of this life should share in the reward or the punishment, which is just what we hear St. Paul referring to in today's epistle. So at the end, again, this resurrection, the bodies of the damned, the, the, the souls will be brought up from hell and their bodies will be united from, and the souls of the blessed will come down from heaven and their bodies reunited with them right then. Because St. Saint, uh, Saint Thomas writes about the souls of the, of the saints in heaven. We're not speaking about Our Lady and St. Joseph, for example, who have their bodies, but the other... They're not men yet. They're in a sort of a violent state because men have a body and a soul, and they're waiting for their bodies. It doesn't mean they're not happy, but they're not fully men yet, the saints, because they don't have their bodies, and they're awaiting them. Okay? The damned aren't fully men yet either. All right. Because angels are pure spirits, but we're not. All right. What else do we want to say? The state of the bodies upon the resurrection. Read you some things here. What state the bodies shall arise? Not only will the body rise, but whatever belongs to the reality of its nature and adorns and ornaments man will be restored. St. Augustine, the great doctor, says, quote, There shall then be no deformity of body. If some have been overweight, they shall not resume their entire weight. All that exceeds the proper proportion shall be deemed superfluous. On the other hand, should the body be wasted by disease or the debility of old age or be emaciated from any other cause, it shall be repaired by the divine power of Jesus Christ, who will not only restore the body, but repair whatever it shall have lost to the wretchedness of this life. Close quote, St. Augustine. The blind who are blind from nature, disease or injury, the lame, the maimed, the paralyzed, they'll all rise again with perfect bodies. See, resurrection is very much like creation. It's one of the principal works of God. At creation, all things came out perfect from the hand of God. And at the resurrection, all things will be perfectly restored by the same almighty hand. There's one interesting fact about the restoration that has to do with the martyrs. I think this is wonderful. The martyrs will ret- retain their scars. St. Augustine, quote, as the mutilation which they suffered would perform, prove a deformity, they shall rise with all their members. Otherwise, those who are beheaded would rise without a head. The scars, however, which they receive shall remain, shining like the wounds of Christ, with a brilliancy far more resplendent than that of gold and of precious stones. Close quote. It's their battle wounds, their scars of love for Christ, just as he kept the wounds to show the Heavenly Father how much he loved him. So they keep those wounds to show the special place they have in heaven as those kind of combat veterans with their real, with the real marks. Huh? The members of the wicked will be restored completely too, although that's in order to increase their punishment. Even the members of their bodies, they lost their own fault. Uh, so those who have done penance shall get everything back, and it will be for their greater reward. Those who have sinned shall get everything back and it will be for their greater pain. 
Okay, that's the state of the bodies. There are interesting qualities of the bodies that are taught. With the scholastic theologians, sum these qualities of the resurrected body, they, they sum them up into four different uh, qualities. But before I talk about the four qualities, there's one thing that people ask commonly. Uh, in risen bodies, we don't need to eat, and there'll be no more children at the end of the world. That's it. So because of that, in a risen body, the nutritive and generative functions will cease because that state of life no longer has need for them. The organs will remain intact. The bodies rise whole and entire, but they will not function at that point in life. Okay, so what are the qualities of, of, uh, that, that, the, 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 uh, that were taught by the scholastics the bodies of the just have? They're broken down into four. There's one called impassibility. It means they're incapable of suffering. Any kind of physical evil, obviously sorrow, sickness, and death will have no more effect on them, but they're unable to suffer. Their, their body is perfectly subject to their soul, and they can't suffer. They're impassibility. There's one called subtlety. And the subtlety, it's a, it's a spiritualized nature. It's not like some New Age thing, but... Uh, or the, the, we can see like in the risen body of Christ, when he rises from the dead, he comes out of the tomb, but it, he doesn't have the stone rolled out. The, the angels roll it out later. He comes out to the tomb. He comes into the upper room while well, it's locked and so forth. And so the, the, there's a complete domination of the body by the transfigured soul. And so that's what they mean by subtlety. Agility, which I think uh, I'm, I'm more fascinated with than others, that's the capability of the body uh, it's so subject to the soul that the body moves at the speed of thought. See, so you can go wherever you want. If This is assuming you're not damned, of course. Let us hope that we all get this gift and not the other one. But one can travel with the speed of thought. And so th- you can see that with our Lord. He's in Emmaus at one moment, and then he just disappears from there because he's traveling to somewhere else. Maybe Jerusalem, we don't know. But he's, in the up, he's uh, uh, at, at, uh, with uh, the, the disciples at Emmaus and then just vanished. So that's... Uh, agility and then clarity that 's being freed from all all deformity, but being filled with beauty and radiance. We see this when our Lord reveals on on the transfiguration he allows the, the glory of his soul to shine through the body at that now the clarity and, and so the, the you know the apostles that were up there with him were just struck by that but the 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 clarity or the brilliance of a particular individual will is proportional to the measure of its merit, so obviously. Our Lady would have the greatest measure, is in all things, but certainly in this gift, she'd have the greatest measure of, of, of all human persons. But it's proportional to the degree of the merits, that's the clarity. So those are the different uh, qualities of a resurrected body. Okay? So, uh, I, I think that's all I want to say on that. The general judgment. Why do we have another judgment? What is the point of having another judgment if we've already been judged once at death? So we've already been judged. What is this point of having to have another judgment in the world? I'll read something, uh, a comment on one of the, one of the teachings of St. Thomas, and we'll go through uh, several of these. The first of these reasons consists in the fact that the works of man, whether they are good or bad, are not, only, are not always isolated, transitory acts. More often, especially in the cases of the leaders of nations and those who are invested with public authority, like bishops and priests, they continue to subsist after they are concluded, either in the memory of other men or in public acclaim, as a result of the consequences they have had and the scandal they have caused. For example, uh, St. Francis is still... The effect that St. Francis had on the world from so many centuries ago will last right to the end of the world. How many people are struck by this amazing personality and his example, and go become Franciscans, Franciscan men and women in all the different orders, that are all the sons and daughters of St. Francis. Or, you know, for a bad example, Luther. Look at the fact that Father Luther, this crazy priest, has had. I mean, he's like one of the priests we unfortunately read about in the newspapers today. But here, the, the evil effects of Luther, Luther's personality or Henry VIII's personality are going to keep on reverberating down through the end of time. Okay? It's as if they, you drop a, a rock in the water and the ripples go. It's like that with the good deeds of men and the bad deeds of men. Okay? Certainly it is of faith that there's a particular judgment and that every man, at the instant of his soul's departure from the body, appears before the tribunal of God to hear his eternal sentence pronounced. 
We just talked about that earlier. Yet this judgment cannot suffice, and it is essential that it should be followed by another public judgment in which God will not examine the actions in isolation and take it in themselves, but will examine them and their effects on other men and the good or evil deriving from them for families and peoples. In a word, in the consequence they have produced in which those who have perpetrated them ought to have foreseen. See, because our sins are not just a sin against God. They have social consequences. And that's one of the reasons for the general judgment, because it brings the social consequences into focus. Other reasons for the general judgment. First, that it may be shown clearly to all how just has been his private judgment, and also that the body, which has been the instrument of sin or of virtue, may share in the soul's punishment or reward. Next, the justice which they could by no means obtain in this life may be rendered before the whole world to the oppressed poor and to persecuted innocents, and that the wicked who have abused the righteous and yet have been considered honest and good may be put to shame before all. Next, that the graces and means of salvation bestowed upon each may be made known. Next, that the blessed providence of God, which often permitted the righteous to suffer evil while the wicked prospered, may be vindicated and be shown on that day that his acts are acts of the greatest wisdom. Next, the wicked may learn the goodness of God, not for their comfort or benefit, but for their greater sorrow. They may see how he rewards even the slightest work performed for his love and honor. And finally, that Christ may be exalted before the wicked on earth as before the good in heaven. The truth of his words may be made solemnly manifest. So those are the reasons for the general judgment. What will happen at the general judgment? So I've assembled this from different fathers and doctors of the church. After the resurrection, all the men will be gathered together at the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The angels will bring them there. That's all of us. Then when the whole human race is assembled, St. Matthew says, the angels will go out and shall separate the wicked from among the just. The brother shall be separated from his brother. The sister shall be separated from her sister. The husband shall be separated from his wife. The son shall be separated from his father. The mother shall be separated from her children. The just will stand on the right, and the wicked shall be driven to the left. St. Paul says, quote, We shall be taken up together with them to meet Christ into the air. Close quote. St. Alphonsus notes that after the separation of the damned from the blessed, then the blessed will be raised up in the air and will go with the angels to meet Jesus Christ descending from heaven. Will the damned are left behind waiting for their judge? St. Matthew says that then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all tribes of the earth mourn. The heavens will open, and the angels who are coming to assist at the last judgment will lead a procession. These angels will be carrying the instruments of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. St. Thomas says that when the Lord comes to judge, the sign of the cross and the other emblems of his passion shall be exhibited. Even though the true cross is now divided into many little pieces, it shall then be reassembled by divine power and carried down solemnly from heaven by the angels, who will also carry the nails, the hammer, the lance, the crown of thorns, the scourges, the pillar, the scarlet robe, the white robe, the seamless garment, the dice, and all the other instruments that were used during the Passion in order to publicly display once and for all, to all of mankind, how great and how many sufferings our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ bore out of love for us in order to release us from our sins. Cornelius Lapide says, Oh, how great will be the wailing of sinners who during their life disregarded their own salvation, which the Son of God purchased at so great a price. After the numeral host of holy angels descends from heaven, then the holy apostles will arrive. And then Our Lady, Queen of Angels and Saints, shall come to assist the last judgment. 
Finally, the judge of the living and the dead shall appear. The Holy Scripture says, And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with much power and majesty. St. Augustine asks, What will become of us on that dreadful day? The day of judgment, when the Lord shall descend with his angels, with the sound of trumpets, and the whole earth shall tremble with fear. St. Alphonsus points out that in the damned, the sight of our Lord coming in judgment will be more painful than hell itself. St. Teresa of Avila used to say, My Jesus, afflict me with every pain, but do not allow me to see thy face enraged against me on that day. St. John says that the damned will call upon the mountains and the rocks to fall upon them and to hide them from the face and wrath of our Lord. Now comes the judgment. The fear of the blessed of the judgment will pass away. The judgment itself will become a source of joy and sweetness for them. As St. Alphonsus points out, our Lord will then give praise to each one for his works. That's not true for the reprobates. St. John Chrysostom says, On that judgment day, they will not receive mercy. St. Anselm says it will be impossible for them to hide and intolerable for them for they appear. St. Alphonsus says that with insufferable pain, they shall be forced to appear in judgment. The witnesses will come forward. St. Augustine says that the devils will be first, and they will say to our Lord, Most just God, declare him to be mine, who is unwilling to be yours. Then their own consciences will witness against them. St. Bernard says it is as if their very sins will speak out and say, You have made us. We are your works, and we will not abandon you. Finally will come the judge himself, who said in his holy word that he will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. As St. Augustine said, he who is now the witness of your life shall be the judge of your cause. At the judgment, there are no excuses. God knows everything. St. Alphonsus points out that the judge will reproach the Catholics, saying, if the graces which I poured down upon you have been given to Muslims and pagans, they would have long ago done penance in sackcloth and ashes. Then he will make known to all men the most secret and shameful sins of the reprobate, which they concealed, even in confession. St. Basil the Great teaches that all the sins of the damned will be able to be seen with a single glance. St. Alphonsus also points out that in the opinion of many holy authors, the sins of the blessed will not be made known, but rather kept hidden. The Sentence of the Blessed St. Bernard says that our Lord will first pronounce the sentence on the blessed, so that the damned will see what they have lost. With a look of love, our Lord will turn to the blessed and say, Come, ye blessed of my Father, possess the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He will bless all the tears they shed and sorrow for their sins, all their good works, all their prayers, all their penances and mortifications, all their holy communions. He will tell them they are saved forever, Our Lady will also bless her servants and will invite them with her to paradise. And then the elect will sing hallelujahs as they begin to praise God forever. Our Lord will then turn to the reprobates and to pronounce their sentence in these words, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. St. Alphonsus points out that then, in the middle of that valley, a great pit will open in which the devils and the damned will fall. They will see that slam shut, never to be opened, never, never for all eternity. In whatsoever position the damned will fall into hell on that last day, in that they must remain without ever changing their posture, without ever being able to move hand or foot, as long as God will be God. The resurrection of the dead is certain. 
we're all going to undergo it. Judgment is certain. And we're all going to undergo it. What is not certain is whether we'll be numbered among the sheep or the goats. Let us make sure of our election.